presentations. Um, I would like to, to um, also bring in the, the, the European uh, dimension here. Uh, we, I think, Ulrike, you, you made it quite clear where, where, the, uh, where the link is when we talk about climate and uh, climate change and environmental issues and uh, that it is indeed a, a global issue which asks for, uh, uh, for, 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 for management, for global governance. Um, however, in relation to, to Southeast Asia and this uh, very, um, well, I mean, those dramatic pictures mm. uh, and, and, and those dramatic developments taking place there in terms of the so-called haze problem, which is smog, uh, actually, and which we find in, 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 uh, in terms of air pollution, we see that in China as well. Um, uh, where, does, where does the EU come in here? Uh, for instance, when we talk about uh, free trade agreements, right, in terms of trade policy, um, is this something where, um, from your work and um, where the EU uh, is in, has, a, has a role to play, uh, is that something um, that, that should become part of the, um, those deep and comprehensive uh, uh, free trade agreements that the EU is currently negotiating or about to negotiate with uh, Southeast Asian uh, partners? Um, and um, do you think that this is a is this the right approach, actually, or uh, what? What is? Uh, what would you suggest? And um, would you, um, Ray? Would you have? Um, would you come across the role of external actors uh, in your uh, in your uh, in your work in your research, or is this all very internally uh, inductive? Um, secondly, where does, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that, but when we compare the developments in terms of climate, um, in terms of, well, uh, the fight against pollution and so on, when we compare this to South Korea and compare this to Japan, civil society, which, which had grave uh, problems in terms of pollution, um, uh, civil society were major factors in, 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 in making it possible change policies, industrial policies, to turn the, the, the pollution, uh, to fight pollution. Um, do you see a role here uh, in, in, for that as well? Thank you. Thank you for your presentations as well. Uh, Ulrika, I wanted to ask you, so <clears throat> we talk a lot about U.S. leadership in retreat and on, on climate change. But if you look at what's actually happening in the U.S., all the governors and many states, mayors, cities are emerging. So I wonder to what extent, you know, we focus a lot on governments and state actors, but I wonder if, if the, the subnational level is not becoming a much more powerful player. And that would also perhaps go for, I mean, you, uh, Wang talked about it uh, at the sub, subnational level. and. I just wondered, uh, Ruben, for you, I mean, I remember when I was writing about these issues in the review, Far Eastern Economic Review, there was a lot of acrimony, political acrimony um, between the countries. And I know in recent years, Malaysia and Singapore, uh, sorry, Mal no, Singapore and Indonesia and Malaysia have had a sort of, you know, battle of words about, these, uh, about this with Indonesia. Uh, has that acrimony sort of political, on the political level diminished uh, with time and did people see it as a shared problem? Or is Indonesia still in the hot seat and being accused of all kinds of, you know, um, breaches of uh, trust and uh, violation of rules? Uh, and on the EU, uh, I think there is the, um, uh, Sebastian, there is the FLECT, you know, uh, the FLECT program, which is about uh, timber. It's, it's a kind of a brand that the EU gives to timber that has been harvested uh, under ecologically, you know, uh, good, uh, and there's also something happening on palm oil, which I'm not sure about, but I know my Malaysian friends and Indonesian friends are very, very angry about EU rules coming in, standards coming in on palm oil, uh, that they fear could become a source of protection and yeah. not meet, not meet standards. Yeah. 
Um, I would like to chip in on, since we brought up the uh, non-state actors and subnational actors, um, I have um, another question maybe going with uh, that particular question, because we were talking about um, the Chinese people, for instance, um, in a well, clear majority wanting to prioritize climate goals. And I was wondering whether there are any regional differences in the sense of subnational regions. Because, I mean, for instance, China is very um, diverse. Um, and I, I could see how maybe if you look a little bit closer on the micro level, there might be um, considerable differences in, in, in desires and, and goals and hopes. Okay, uh, first round, uh, we uh, do better in the reverse order. So, go on. Um, okay, so thank you for your questions. Um, first, I would like to say something uh, regarding the EU's involvement, uh, involvement in the environmental policies in... Um, no. Uh, I don't think I can I can say anything for um, South Asian Asia, but for China, I think EU is an is is actually a active partner as well, because um, per perhaps it's not that visible as um, it is, but actually China is making um, its moves um, regarding the requirements of the international society. That is to say, first of all, um, as we can see uh, for the uh, for the national level, we are currently the most per, uh, advanced ad, uh, development in terms of these um, environmental measures um, exist in the carbon trading market. So it's pretty much in response to the um, requirements of the EU and the broader international community. Um, and secondly, there is a, um, I think this morning, Professor Zhu just um, raised that um, China is conducting massive investment in a new energy development, which is, again, in cooperation with a lot of EU partners, notably uh, with France and Germany. Um, so I think there is a active involvement um, in the uh, environmental policies in China as well, uh, of EU. Um, the second question actually is quite related. Um, that is, um, Sebastian asked if there is external actors for this um, NES program. So yes, it is. Um, and what I want to add is that the fact uh, is the fact that um, since the NES is based on the SEA project, which is originally dropped by the. Um, United Nations and World Bank, we have a lot of consultants and uh, think tanks that came from these international organizations um, who helped us to build these, um, the structure of these um, accounting programs. But the, um, again, as I said, the, um, the use of this accounting structure is, again, um, another problem apart from the, um, the use of uh, of it in the cater appraisal system. So it's kind of combined question of um, improving the cater appraisal system and to manage the physical resources uh, in the same time. So it's kind of complicated for, um, for this project, which is, um, I tried to demonstrate in the, dem uh, in the in presentation. Um, and thirdly, the, civ uh, the involvement of civil society, um, I would like to say that um, there is, um, well, um, first of all, I would like to stress the point that um, for China, in, uh, sustainable development, as I see, is pretty much a state-driven initiative. That means um, the involvement of civil society is kind of limited, it's especially compared to the EU and US or um, other demo uh, democratic countries. Um, it is limited in the formal term, but actually the um, society is actively involved in the debate of environmental issues. As we can see, there is um, um, the voice from <laughs> internet is actively um, uh, voiced in the, um, uh, in the society. 
Um, so I would say <coughs> the people's voice is not directly, or you know, from uh, is the people's voice is not heard through the channel of civil society, but rather from a rather scattered manner, like from the internet and stuff. Um, I think this is pretty much I would like to say. Thank you. Perhaps first to your question, Diana. Um, the data is from the World Values Survey. And um, I asked myself the same question, but I couldn't get the information. But you're perfectly right. Yeah? Um, you have a large middle class at the East Coast who probably thinks differently than um, poor households in central in, in, in center China. Yeah. But there is no information. And um, to your question, I mean, it's good to see that um, we have got powerful play players on a um, subnational level, and that the U.S. population, obviously, perhaps, yeah, that doesn't even need the state. But um, nevertheless, I think that we still need the states to um, give the direction, because to be conscious of environmental problems and to, and to act accordingly are still two different things. So that's why we need regulations. Uh, Shada asked about political acrimony in Southeast Asia. Uh, yes, I mean, it, 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 it always comes up. <laughs> Every time there's an episode, uh, Malaysians and Singaporeans will point to Indonesia as, as, uh, as, as not doing enough or doing nothing about the haze. And the Indonesians, uh, very interestingly, would point back at Singapore and Malaysia and say that a lot of the fires were caused by uh, companies that uh, have Singapore and Malaysia connections. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of finger pointing going around and it's quite funny. I mean, if, if it, it would be very funny if not for the health, the real health issues that, that occur. For example, uh, I think 20, 15, when the, there was a last round of a very bad haze, uh, the Indonesian environment minister uh, made a startling statement, which was, uh, why are the Singaporeans and Malaysians complaining about the bad air from Indonesia? 11 months of the year, we, give, we have clean air. We are responsible for the clean air, and we don't get any thanks. For one month, there's bad air, and we get all this flag. <laughs> I think in most other countries, he'll be out of a job. <laughs> but in Indonesia, he managed to survive. So my sense is there needs to be greater domestic pressure in this country, Indonesia, because the, the people who are most affected who, and people who die are actually poor Indonesians who are living in or around the old uh, palm oil plantations. But they have no voice in the system. So actually, they need the help of not just the city folk in Indonesia, but also the NGOs and the citizens of other ASEAN countries. Now, th these kinds of developments are very new to Southeast Asia because it really impinges on the ASEAN way and it embarrasses national governments. Uh, so uh, that's why this, this is a rapidly evolving issue which you can see it's, it's beyond any one government's control. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to come up again. I just hope that you know, we, we don't have anything on the scale of 2013 or 2015. The, Sebastian asked about the, the role of the EU and whether EU rules might make a positive difference or would the EU get accused of neocolonialism? Um, I, I think the EU can play a role because uh, some of the resolutions from the EU actually could work either way. Uh, I remember when the EU had a rule about biodiesel, uh, it kind of uh, um, favoured uh, biodiesel and many people thought that this actually was a green light to increase palm oil production because that's considered biodiesel. But when you, when you look at this carefully, you realise that the carbon footprint of uh, producing palm oil is that much higher. 
So actually, the EU was accused by NGOs and by some groups in Brussels and, and also outside in Southeast Asia of outsourcing the pollution. That means there's no pollution in the EU, but it takes place in Southeast Asia. So uh, policies, I think, uh, from the EU can actually make a difference, but they have to think about the carbon footprint, not just moving it outside of Europe, but what is the carbon footprint in the world? Does it add or take away from the carbon production? I think uh, I can give some comments to uh, Dr. Wang uh, concerning the question uh, raised by Sebastian. Uh, when uh, we uh, have to look into the uh, EU's role, probably you could uh, look uh, into the uh, framework agreement between EU and China. I had the chance to read uh, this document between Korea and EU. They have well uh, structured the discourses, right? The statements about uh, cooperation, needs of cooperation on uh, sustainability, on development assistance, things like that. So probably you can uh, take a look. As well as uh, uh, Professor Gottwald uh, in the previous session uh, showed us a very uh, complex uh, uh, organizational chart of uh, EU-China cooperation. Probably there you can find some uh, environmental committee, right? So, so that uh, could be. So there is uh, no FPA in China. Yeah. There is no framework partnership. But uh, China is a strategic partner yeah. of uh, the European yeah. Union. So uh, framework agreement uh, is uh, already there, right? Bernadette? Thank you for three very important uh, contributions to this uh, seminar. I just, um, I'm just wondering whether the environment is not an excuse, basically. To re you mentioned, somebody mentioned the, the, the palm oil and the tariffs that have been imposed in the, by the EU, EU. Presumably there are no EU multinational interests in the palm oil industry in, uh, in those countries, in Southeast Asia, right? In the end of the day, they are. Well, not not imp not important enough to. Uh, right. right. Okay. It's from an economic viewpoint. There is an easy substitute that can be found, and which so th yes, there is a supply substitution and so on. So, so. so then we we had, for example, the TTIP. Right. It fell through, and we knew that the environmental issue was a big concern of uh, of all the. Um, groups, um, con contesting groups um, at grassroots levels. CEFTA, well, from the e EU viewpoint, CEFTA with Canada, I didn't follow closely, but I presume like, Canada doesn't have great environmental standards, right? With oil fracking and so on and so forth. So what has been happening in terms of the investment directive, right? The, which was enshrined, for example, in the um, TTIP with the, the Trans um, Investment Partnership with the US, right? Um, I'm just I'm just wondering whether the extent to which the environment is really taken seriously by the different uh, actors and particularly the European Union, right? Just I'm skeptical. So. I mean, in theory, it is. It's always high up there. It's one of the goals. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a maybe general question to the panelists. Um, I think, for example, the RSPO, as you mentioned, um, uh, has a very small share on the market of palm oil. And also with the en uh, energy vendor that you mentioned, um, I think Greenpeace just um, had an action um, to point on the um, coal imports. Um, and I think. Uh, when we look at um, this environmental um, issues, um, I think it's very complex. And I'm wondering if um, a global um, environmental governance or even on the actor base um, level, um, if they actually are effective or um, also in China with the structural change, if there's um, if that is actually enough or are we on the wrong track maybe? 
for uh, finding solutions. So, uh, is there any information from the panels? Actually, we are on the wrong track. Yeah, because not even the Paris Agreement is guaranteeing the two degree goal. Yeah. But it's all we have to work with. So we should take the Paris Agreement seriously and work from that. Yeah. I mean, it's always the question, yeah, is, is um, the... Um, should, should I just add, uh, for example, um, I heard a um, presentation about evolutionary economics and <laughs> I know it's a, a small field maybe of economics but um, there was a suggestion that we need a change in the values for example that um, we still have the GDP dom um, uh, dominance and um, that we stick to um, for example in economics that we stick to um, uh, looking more at human behavior, also on external effects, that it's always um, a human-to-human -human relationship, but we never really look on, uh, for example, interests of the nature or something. So that maybe we need to have a shift in values on also considering um, for more uh, sustainable development. Um, what the WBGU, the Wissenschaftliche Beirat der Bundesregierung, is suggesting, yeah, not only to look at, for example, technical innovations, but on a societal transformation, so to change values. But I would be extremely careful um, when you talk about a value of the nature in itself, because, you know, it, it is easier to say, we, we just need that nature, we are living in it, so um, it is... Um, it is important for us to conserve it. Yeah, we don't have to. And perhaps the value there is a value of nature, but it's not important for us to, to consider that at the moment. It's enough to say, okay, we need we need the nature, yeah, to live. And um, yeah, evolutionary economics um, is, is a very helpful approach, but I would say you shouldn't um, confine these approaches to economics, really. But um, we, we need holistic approaches. Economics, um, nature science, philosophical views, perhaps, yeah, all that combined. Just picking up on this, I think you, Ulrika had a very good uh, table, if I'm not mistaken, showing the, um, the trade-off be between the environmental issue concern and the jobs concern across a few countries. And the only country that's where we had a small majority of people who was more pro-environment as opposed to job was Germany, because Germany can afford it, basically, right, in a sense. Right, but I, I I forgot the figure. I think it was 53 percent. It was just above the 50 percent mark. So yeah, how long will it take for all countries of the world to, to perform to that level? And you know, it's uh, it's uh, you know, yeah. It's, this is from an economic viewpoint, and the environment looks like a, a luxury in the short term because we we still are faint thinking in terms of short term. Multinational companies that think for the next quarter, for the, for the two next quarters, and that's it. Whereas, of course, it's a long-term concern, right, yeah. as we know, but... I think if you take these um, <coughs> limits of nature seriously, um, we can only act within these limits. Yeah. And uh, to say, okay, we have short-term goals, doesn't, doesn't make too much sense then. Yeah. Because if you, if you take this limit seriously, that's it. And um, economic growth doesn't guarantee uh, a growth of life, of quality of life, even in developing countries. Because, for example, in China, um, company profits have been rising for the last years. But um, labor, um, um, labor, not what you mean. Yeah, the, the, um, yeah, the share of the labor um, is sinking. Yeah. 